Good evening. It's Monday night. The Olympics are in full swing and you are watching The Punter. And you're watching it on Sports Tonight in the company of myself, Trevor Harris, and Chris Graham. How are you, Chris? I'm good, Trevor. I'm good. I'm really enjoying the Olympics. Huh? I'm also good, but I'm frustrated. Yeah? Very frustrated Tell by this, this cauldron uh, will not go away. The whole <laughs> nonsense surrounding it. This controversy. Different bookmakers, different rules. I don't get it. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't too surprised, to be honest with you, with the, the different uh, payout systems. I mean, various incidents, these tend to happen where, where some bookmakers will, will pay out in controversial decisions. So I, I wasn't too surprised. And a very shrewd move by Paddy Power and Labrooks uh, paying out in the seven metres and what is a very mainstream market. You say it's a shrewd move. And just to let you know exactly what Chris is talking about, Paddy Power and Labrooks are paying out on any of the mentors, some of the likes of Redgrave and Kelly Holmes, who had a mentor, one of those young athletes like the Cauldron, uh, William Hill, on the other hand, are refunding all stakes. So if you back, say, Roger Bannister with Hills, it's a money-back job. If you backed him with either Labrooks or Paddy Power, you lose your dough. One man whose uh, input on this I'm fascinated to hear is Russ Wiseman. We'll speak to Russ a little bit later. But why do you think it's fair? Why do you think it's fair? I don't get... If I'm back Roger Bannister mm. with, uh, with Paddy Power, I'm furious because my mate, who's backed him with Hills, hasn't lost his money and I have. It's a, it's a volatile, really... Um an ordinary market, you know, it's, it's not an everyday market. And when you place a bet in this kind of market, you've got to expect strange things to happen or sometimes not even get a run for your money. And that's mm. what's happened to a lot of these people who've bet on Roger Bannister. But Labrooks and Paddy Power didn't really have to, to get involved and, and pay out the seven mentors. Um, so, you know, if you've backed one of those seven, you've got a nice surprise. Yes, but it's no consolation to me as a Bannister backer. I guess whichever side of the fence you're on is, yeah. is the side... He wasn't side... involved, so he shouldn't get paid. No. That, that's, that's well, but, but no, because Bannister, OK, he didn't light it, you're right, but nor did Redgrave, and nor did Kelly Holmes, they didn't light it either. Yeah, I, I would have... If I had backed them and not got paid, I would have yeah. accepted that. Right. I just think it's a nice bonus by Ladbrokes and Paddy Power, a very shrewd one, and a calculated one, with, with bear in mind it's a very mainstream market that was discussed in the BBC. But yeah, um, I'll tell you what I think. I think there should be an option on all these kind of novelty markets, any other or none of the above. So we, we had the Queen, we had David Bond, we had Harry Potter. There sh if there was an any other quoted, that would have solved the problem, wouldn't it? It would have been a very short price, to be honest. OK, but that, still it would have given punters an option and there wouldn't have been any argument. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. But, you know, it's a fun market. Mm. Stakes should have been very low. Mm. I just, I wouldn't get bogged down in how serious this is. I mean, you know, I, I would feel sorry for like... But it's, it's a point of principle, I think, Chris. Yeah, I, I happen to think that if I had a bad balance, I wouldn't have been too bothered. I would have just accepted it and reveled in the opening You're scenario. a better loser than me, <laughs> for sure. Um, I want to talk to you about happier things now, yes. Olympic-wise. Both of us were very sweet, weren't we, on the, the pre-Olympic bet, most gold medals, China versus the States... We're off to a flying start. Seven or four we tipped it up at, didn't we? we did. um, seven three is the current score. Yeah. And the other good news, seven three to China that is, the yeah. other good news is America have won five silvers. So that's five chances for golds mm -hmm. they cannot win. Absolutely, Trevor. You, you called it first and I, I followed you and I thought it was a great show. I, I just couldn't understand the pure price discrepancy between the US mm. and China after China won 15 more gold medals in 2008 than the US counterparts. And we've saw, we've saw China rise up from finishing 11th in 1988 right up to being top of the pile in 2008. Mm. They're on the way upwards. And that, that original price of 74 was very generous. It's early days, but let's talk to the man whose firm laid 7-4 to four, to both Chris and to me, mm. and hopefully to you, about China winning more golds. Russ Wiseman from Sporting Bet. How are you, Russ? Hey, sir. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Hi, Russ. Um, are you about to um, take your athletics or your Olympic uh, trader out and give him a flogging for, for putting up 7-4 to four about the Chinese? Early days, but they've got a nice little lead already. He's on coffee duty, trust coffee <laughs> duty, that guy. We don't like him at the moment. He's not doing a good job at all. No, it's a very tricky market, this one, because I still think we'll see some fluctuation. Obviously, the initial 74 we laid, we did see some good money odds on for, for the USA, but the bulk of the money then, when the big tipping papers came out, the big tipping lines was for uh, the Chinese. You guys were ahead of the market, and that has to give you credit for that as well. But there's a long way to go, isn't it, guys? A lot of gold medals to be won, but yep. looking at momentum at the moment and the way it started off and, and just the pure mass of it, they look good odds on shots at the moment, China. Yeah, they do. I think the big money you saw for the States was Bet Butlers, who's um, going to be in the poorhouse <laughs> shortly. Um, got to ask you, Russ, about the, the controversy that Chris and I were just talking about, um, the cauldron. I think I did actually ask you, didn't I, last week, what happens if it's none of the above 
And that's exactly what has happened. And we've got this situation where different bookmakers have different rules. And I find that a little bit off, to be honest. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I didn't actually hear the previous conversation, so apologies for that. But I've got very firm views on this, actually. And you might not like what I'm about to say, but, you know, punters, you have to tread very carefully on what I call a silly market. This is a silly market, guys. This isn't mm. for proper punters. This is five and ten, as we said. And I think you just have to accept that if you're betting on markets like that, you just have to abide by what the bookmakers say. Bookmakers are under absolutely no obligation at all to make gesture payouts on something that wasn't a winner. Now, people had actually made a, 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 a request for any other or uh, any other name. Bookmakers are obliged usually to price that up. Yeah. But it is very, very difficult if you're in, in that situation. But me personally, if it was my market, I would avoid all bets just return stakes. I certainly wouldn't pay out on uh, as some firms have already done. But you can imagine the numbers involved in, in this, boys. It's not big at all. It's, it's tiny money. Yeah. It really isn't a, a significant factor. If it was hundreds of thousands of pounds, let's be honest about it, do you really think us bookmakers will be fucking out? It's a PR so many times. I've been part of that as well. I'm glad to sit this one out, I have to say. OK, well, no, I mean, I think we were saying it was a, a kind of point of principle. I accept the amounts involved are not great. All I, say, all I was saying to Chris was that if I had backed um, Roger Bannister, uh, then I would be a bit miffed about losing my money at Labrooks, whereas I would have got it back at Hills. Graham Sharp, who usually talks sense on these matters, said no one could have predicted this, and he, like you, said just give everyone their money back. I couldn't agree more, Trev. I think that, well, I mean, listen, I mean, yeah, you have to have some fundamental rules in place. I absolutely agree with yourself and Graham Sharp on this one. I mean, you didn't get a run for your money. Uh, I think common sense has to prevail. I hundred percent do not subscribe to the fact that there should be uh, concessionary payouts just for PR purposes. Yeah. Because, like I say, those those really are just a stunt, and you know the money involved then is small. Uh, you know, it has to be stakes refunded. Completely not fair. Uh, to not, not receive your money back in that situation. All right, well, let's just, let's just going to rub in this gold medal thing with you, us. We're going to show the odds for the latest odds for which country is going to win the most gold medals. Four to seven, China, wow. eight to five, the USA, anything you like the rest. It's all turned round, Chris. Magnificent. It's the classic flip flop, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's a complete flip flop, and isn't that just gorgeous to see? So, would you be expecting any money now for China, or are they too short, Russ? Well, it's pretty much so. I mean, I just spoke to our traders now who are going to update the end of play. They're going to be four to nine, cha cha. So wow. even shorter than that. So, wow. you know, you have to look at betting momentum at the moment. And, we're, and let's put this in perspective, guys. We're watching the Olympic team, we're listening to commentators, we're listening to pundits like you. When they put that medals table up at the end of each night and people physically look at it, everybody wants to back the team who are in front. Yeah. That's the way that people usually look at it. That's the way they want to, they want to be. At the moment, I can only see there being money for China, but it's, a, it's still very hard to step in. Clearly, the USA are going to have a good run at some point. Yes. It's just a question whether China are going to be uh, long gone, but they seem to have so much depth in their uh, team, China. Uh, some of their athletes really are producing at the, at the highest level. We're going to mention one of them who I think could be the superstar of the games in the swimming uh, 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 regatta at the moment. But, I mean, it really is a, a, a fascinating market, this. Definitely got this call right, you guys, and well done to, to, to do that as well. Well, if it, if it gets any shorter, I think it should just pay us out, like, like <laughs> uh, some chaps do with United every <laughs> every March. <laughs> <laughs> let's um, let's move to Formula One because uh, it was a fascinating weekend yet again. Hamilton won in Hungary, and I just sense a bit of a sea change, Chris, with the yeah. way that the, the championship's yeah. going now. Yeah, I mean, it, you just. Lewis Hamilton must be so gutted that this mid-season break's happening yeah. now. They finally look like they've got the car sorted out yes. at last, the McLaren yeah. car, the much-divided McLaren car. Looks like they've sorted it out. And yeah, we've saw his price half from 11-1 to and 11-2 to for, for the, the Drivers' Championship with some firms. And yeah, uh, momentum at last with McLaren. Yeah. Huh? What, do you, what do you think, Russ? Um, is this a potential milestone in the season that Hamilton now can challenge for the title? He's, he's a fair way back. He's about 50-odd points back, but with 25 for a win... He could still do it, couldn't he? Oh, good guys, I think you're even underselling it. I think it's a huge uh, sea change. And, uh, and Chris mentioned there the, the kind of half-time break, Trev. We're off for a month now. Yeah. Um, you're completely right in saying that maybe it would be nice to, to sneak in another quick race for the McLarens. But uh, they've got mm. some great momentum with them now. They've clearly got something right. This month, really, is when the, the title will probably be decided. Any adjustments people are making, the, yeah. the work that the drivers do with their teams, you know, you know, obviously it's a month off, but this is the real hard grind from the engineering point of view. But, you know, look at those points. I mean, it's not as big as you mentioned. Trev, you were quite right last week in saying that 40 points or 25 points as it was at the time between the Alonso and the second. It looks like a lot, but all you need is 
two or three good races, and yeah. all of a sudden you're in front. So I think, uh, as Chris mentioned, the, the price may fall, but you have to say that when this starts kicking off again in Belgium, the money will surely be for Hamilton, unless we hear some bad vibes from that team. All right, let's have a look at the odds then, shall we? The current odds on the Formula One Drivers' Championship. 10 to 11 odds, he's still odds on. Vettel at threes, Hamilton at sixes. That, that, that six to one appeals to me a little bit, I've got to say. Yeah, momentum completely behind yeah. him. Like I say, 11 to one, he was, um, and you can only see him getting short on yeah. If this McLaren car really has sorted itself out, they seem pretty happy after the events yesterday. That price will definitely go. Perhaps before Spa, before the Belgian Grand Prix, it'll be a lot shorter on that, like Russ suggests. Um, Alonso just sort of, just, just drifting a wee bit at 10 to 11. That was his 23rd consecutive points finish yesterday. What a man. Consistency is his middle yeah, name. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. So, 6 to 1, Lewis Hamilton. You may well very think, or you may very well think even that is value, and I wouldn't put you off. 10 to 11, Alonso, with the car seemingly nowhere near as dominant as it was earlier in the season. That'll do it for part one. Russ, if I could ask you to stay with us, perhaps put a pair of Speedos on during <laughs> the break, because we're going to talk swimming when we come back. We'll see you in a moment. Welcome back to The Punter. You are watching uh, Sports Tonight, of course. And we're going to talk swimming. Three big finals coming up imminently. Three gold medals to be dished out. The men's 200-metre mm. freestyle, I think, is the highlight wow. of tonight. Wow. This Chinese guy, Sun Yang, I watched yeah. him yesterday. He's kind of like the most arrogant swimmer I've ever seen because he has that kind of slightly, yeah, I'm number one, like, celebration thing yeah. he does. But he's clear, I mean, he's the, he's the world record holder at 1,500, yeah. and he's already won the 400 metres goal. Oh, he's been, for me, the star of the game so far. You're right, mm. he's, he's, his approach is almost American-like, isn't it? Huh? He's, he's, his arrogance, but, yeah, it's quite refreshing to see him, a non-American actor like that, really. Yeah, bad bit. news for you, Russ, I'm afraid. Another Chinaman who's, uh, who's on form. Well, he's, I mean, he's fantastic. This guy, is, is, Chris has mentioned the star so far of the games, I think... If things go according to plan here, guys, this is going to be the face and star of the entire game. So, yeah. I mean, let's put this in perspective. This is a guy who's hacked up in the 400. He started off these heats. The semi-finals, he was 9-1 to one before the semi-final, Trev. Wow. He's 11-10 to 10 now to win his 200 metres freestyle. 200 metres, bear in mind. And his best event, <laughs> for which he's 10 on, is the 15th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the equivalent, by the way. And I've spoken to somebody who's an expert at this. It's the equivalent of Usain Bolt winning the 100 metres and then winning the 400 metres. Now, oh. can you imagine if he was to do that, Usain Bolt? This guy is just rewriting the books. If he can do the business tonight, we're going to see something very, very special do. Well, here are the prices. Okay. You can see them up there, Chris. Uh, 11 to 10, Yang. 2 to 1, uh, Ang Yao, and, and 17 to 5, bar yeah. those two. So, he, uh, oh, the price, he looks a good thing. You just look at the graphic and you just get excited. I mean, I, oh, I've got to miss this race because I'm, I'm still in the studio when yeah. it goes off. But there's Yang, the favourite son, Yang, 11 to 10. Ag Nell, you know, he, uh, amazing last night in the really, you know, reeling in the US, yeah. absolutely amazing. He reeled in Ryan Lochte, of course, who's 17 to 5. Yeah. And then you've got Biedemann, who who's got the world record for this. For this, for this event at 20 to 1, then Park at 60 61, who was second yeah. to Phelps in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. It's a race dripping with quality. Yeah. I can't Park wait. is 66 to 1, amazing. Are you seeing any kind of volume of money on the swimming, Russ? Terrific money, uh, Trev, really good money. Surprisingly, I have to say, our forecasts at Sporting Bet have been uh, blasted wide open. One of the main reasons, guys, is that people again enjoy backing the favourites, but I mean, obviously, we're talking about coverage on a, a rival media channel, but when you listen to the, the commentators, um, ahead of each event, they are so adamant uh, about certain people that the odds are moving around and fluctuating. I mean, if you'd have listened to the, the country team last night ahead of the men's 4 by one hundred metre freestyle, you'd have awarded the gold medal to Australia prior to the thing he's yeah. happened. They went off threes, on for God's sake. Absolutely incredible. So you do see big money in that last three or four minutes. Huge money. I'm sure Lockheed will be back at 100 to 30 around there. But, you know, on the evidence of what we've seen so far, all the pro money for this guy, Sun Yang, like I said, 9 to 1 pre these semi finals, 11 to 10. Now, how can you post this guy? This guy looks like a machine. And like I said, if he does the business tonight with his best event to come, we're going to see the face of the game soon. You might have seen Chris and I just jigging about there to that disco as it started in the studio. Um, so presumably for this, Russ, you've been waiting to do that all oh, night. Presumably for this race, Russ, it's all, it's all money for Yang, is it? There's, there's not, no one else being backed, or is there? Well, well, there's one interesting part about this, um, this market, guys, and I think it's something we should bear in mind. The only person who's remained static pre-Olympic Games to, to the race taking place tonight is Daniel. I mean, he's obviously a consistent performer. He's done nothing wrong so far. 
Obviously, Yang here is at his absolute minimum distance. I mean, like I said, his yeah. best event, 1,500 metres. Let's put that in perspective, fellas. Oh. No 800 metres for the men, like in the women, for example. 1,500 metres is his optimum distance. He's dropping back in trip. It's the equivalent of uh, um, a man half winning the arc going back <laughs> to win the July Cup. <laughs> so you put it that perspective from a horse yeah. racing point of view. So it's about Anne Yao, I think. He can possibly beat Yang. I still think Lochte is too short on what he's done so far in this particular event. It's between them two. Looking at value, you take the Frenchman, but Yang at the moment, like I say, uh, unstoppable in terms of where the money is. OK. Um, we're going to move on to the, uh, the backstroke. Yeah. Um, the men's backstroke, 100 metres. And there's a bit of British interest, Chris, with Liam Tancourt. Liam Tancourt, yeah. This is, this is, this isn't his ideal event. He's a 50 metre man. He's world champion at 50 metres backstroke. So this, yeah. is quite, this is a bit long for him, but there's no other, I should point out there's no other event. 50 metres no. miles, not including the Olympic Games, but yeah, he, he's up against it tonight. He's clearly the, the third best in this in this particular event. 16 to one, I think, is probably a fair price. This Matt Grivers has looked, you know, really outstanding. The second fastest guy ever at this event, so he, you know, he, he deserves to be long odds on for me. But Tancock, four to six to win a medal, that's a bit fair. So fingers crossed for Liam later tonight. Eh? All right, well there he is, 16 to one shot. Grievers one to five. Mm. They're short on their short rust, but I guess. Big hitters might be interested. Yeah, very much so, uh, Trevor. Again, uh, Matt Grievous last night, I mean, six foot eight, uh, 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 an incredible wingspan. I mean, what a specimen this guy is. Um, great chance he's only picking to break the world record tonight, fellas, so he really has got it all, um, all in front of him. Anything like a, a swim that he put in the semis will be enough. The interesting one about Tancock, and Chris is bang on, 50 metres is his optimum trip. But last night in the semis, r remarkably, really, he was behind the halfway yeah. and actually finished the strongest yes, yeah. of everybody in his heat. So you know, that has actually bodes very well for Liam Tancock. And as he said in his interview last year, if you can find a few tenths from somewhere, a medal's a very real possibility. And uh, like I say, he's third favourite at the moment. Good chance, four to six is the right price. He's got to take something magical to beat this guy, Matt Greer, with Yeah, so effectively, four to six, that's kind of the each way. Because can you actually bet normally each way in a swimming race or not, Russ? No, you, well, you can on certain events, Trev, on, on this one we're sitting out, when you've got such a massive odds-on favourite, as you know people who back in the, in, in the odds-on when there's horse racing, but make us tend to stay clear of it. We'll yeah. win only tonight. I think that's the correct terms. I think a lot of the sharks out there who watch the punter will be surfing around some each way, but if there is, it's probably only going to be third two in an event like this because they're not really going to open it up for the uh, for the each way uh, thieves. So, yeah. yeah, I think the market there is, is obviously, if you bet the 50 odds, for example, or 16, you'd, you'd pay up, up around about three to one money. So, 46 yeah. for the medal, about the right price. If he swims like he did last night, big chance. Yeah, when he was third fastest, wasn't he, in the heat? So. He was, he was. So, yeah, yeah. you... you, you I mean, it, it, this is this is his best chance. This, these games will be too old and real, so it's all been building up to this particular event, like so many of the British mm. swimmers. And yeah, I, I'm confident he can get a bronze tonight. Okay, let's move it on to the uh, the women's backstroke event because yeah. this um, looks like not going to either China or America if the heat's ready to go. We've got an Aussie who's quickest. Yeah, uh, she's she, she looked she's looked amazing. I mean, Emily Seabum. Yeah, Emily Seabum. She, she was. She was quite a big price actually to win this, and she's just absolutely stormed in the heats and the semis. And there we go, two to nine. She's absolutely blistered the field here, two to nine. Um, the favourite was this Franklin, uh, thirteen mm. to two, and she's really been disappointing. But Seabom, yeah, I think two seconds faster. Uh, wow. In this heat, then she's run, then she's swam any time this season. Well, that's so incredible. It's, it's absolutely incredible, and it's, it's blown the Australian media away yeah. as well. Yeah. Absolutely incredible story, and looking a strong favourite here now. I'm just wondering, Russ, whether you know we talked about the big hitters. That there could be a, a little double here if you back the two favourites in the men's and the women's backstroke, just to up those odds a little bit. You'd be well, not a million miles short of even money, I suppose. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a short price trap, but I mean, I suppose uh, we'd be cheering on the, the false star, maybe get this green or see what <laughs> maybe get it a bit early. But yeah, this is a fascinating market as well. If you look at the value here, it's an interesting one, because obviously before the tournament here, it was six, four to six on Seabon, um, Missy Franklin five to two. She's been touted as the big star, Missy Franklin, hasn't delivered in the pool, which is where people want to see it, really. Um, the big time discrepancy, obviously, but she's seven to one now. We've got seven on Seabon. We think she's an absolute shoe in here, but I suppose seven, eight to one about Missy Franklin is a big enough price. Mm. There won't be any each way available, obviously, in, in that particular race, but uh, Seabon at the moment, she, you know, we like to be with people who do it in the pool. It's a lot of rumour, a lot of kind of conjecture, speculation about these people. That's why we like being against the likes of Phelps as well at the moment, not doing the business, but mm. Missy Franklin, the talking horse here, 
have to do in the pool, hasn't done it yet. You've got to be with the jolly here, guys. Just one thing I, I wanted to ask you about your Olympic betting, Russ. I mean, obviously, the BBC's coverage tonight probably will focus on the on the swimming, but there are all sorts of other sports going on at the same time, and you presumably are, are actually laying some of them in play. Is it is it a bit tricky just to keep track of every single thing that's happening in the tennis, the beach volleyball, the table tennis, the badminton? I mean, there can be like 15, 20 sports going on at the same time. I'll tell you, it's, a, it's a fantastic point, and it's actually one I've just spoken with about our Olympic trader, who Chris knows very well, I can show you, uh, yeah. literally just an hour ago. Right. And it's fascinating stuff because we are trying to trade everything in running. We, are, we have made a commitment to trade every single event as well, so we're obviously not kind of picking and choosing that stuff yet, and it's really opening the door mm. for punters. We've been taken to the Queens today on a weightlifting, with there was a, uh, a weightlifter change, weightlifter 5 to 2. We're not threes on, guys. We missed it, we didn't quite pay attention, right. and we've ended up paying big, big time. But on the flip side of that, people are obviously following in a lot of these media hype things, like the Aussie 4x100 metre freestyle mm. team. They've been getting big. So it's balancing out, but I have to say, if you are prepared to put the work in, put a bit of time and effort into this, and just pick your spots, you will find bookmakers like Sporting Bet who make the odd mistake, great chance to make a few quid fellas. I mean, without, without giving away any kind of uh, trade secrets, I mean, how many... How many traders would you have on Olympic duty at a really busy time? Because it must be more than one, obviously. Is it five? Is it ten? Yeah, well, basically, so what we've done here, we, we've, we've assigned it to, to one senior guy who will overlook everything. And right. then it's literally, and this gives you an idea of what good chance you've got. We're literally chopping it up then to every other trader in the office, and they've been given certain events. It's up to them to then research it, find out what's going on in that particular event, and price it up accordingly. So, you know, you know the real possibility here is you're getting guys who may be... Um, uh, obviously, Swedish football trader, for example, you may well be trade trading their judo all of a sudden. May never have even seen uh, a, a judo match before in his life, but you may have to do. So we're, we're kind of chopping up, giving a good service to the punters, but it definitely opens up the, the, the door, like you said, Trev. And, uh, and when resources are stretched like this, mistakes can be made. So it's, it's going to be fascinating to see how it works out. At the moment, I'd say it's 50 50. Right. Few gambles going in, but plenty going to rise well. Swedish football traders. Having to trade judo. Music yeah. to the punters. <laughs> Russ, for now, thank you very much. Um, we'll speak yeah. to you again soon on the punter. Yes, yeah, don't wait for Thanks, Russ. Yeah. Cheers, Russ. Uh, that was Russ Wiseman of Sporting Bet. When we come back, we are going to talk uh, a little bit more swimming and we'll also have some hockey and some football. Back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching uh, Sports Tonight. This is the punter. And last night, of course, huge celebrations right across the nation as Becky Adlington won another medal. Not a gold one, unfortunately, but it was a medal, a bronze uh, in the 400 metres. And that was maybe more than even she expected, judging from her comments pre-race. Yeah, I think um, when she won the heat, we were really, really happy and we thought, oh, she's, she's back. And then, then in the, the, proceed, in the, the heats that followed, suddenly she was in danger of not qualifying for the final. Everyone was getting quite worried, but then she got in, in eighth place on that horrible lane, but she, I yeah. think she, she really showed her experience, her grit, her determination, and a, a fantastic bronze, and, you know, she's, she's the darling of the country, isn't she? And the other interesting point about it was that her time that she swam last yeah. night was quicker yeah. than she swam when she won the gold, which just shows you how, how others she's, have improved during that four-year period. It's just a, and that, you see so many world records getting smashed at, at the Olympics pool. Mm. Uh, almost at one, one in three events t uh, tends to be a world record. That shows you how much... Uh, the sport progresses over the four-year period. Huh? Next up for Becky is the 800 yeah. metre. I think it's on Friday. Friday, yeah, Friday. And this is her best event, and she's an odds-on favourite, which surprised me a little bit. Yeah, I would expect I her to that, be, huh? you know, a shortish price, but odds-on. I was surprised. Sure. I was surprised at that. I, I think mm. I can't actually remember, but I'm sure she was six to four when uh, when this originally went out before last night was out. Last night's race, you know, one to two, she's actually shorter in places. Two's on, yeah, wow. Two on. Well, Lottie Fries here is a three to one, uh, three to one second favourite. Um, she's and then Caroline Ledecky, she's absolutely fascinating at nine to one. She's only she was born in 1997. This wow. girl, this Ledecky girl, absolutely extraordinary. America's young sweetheart, and um, she's she's posted some really fast times uh, this particular year. And I think nine to one is pretty big for this 15 year old. Incredible, isn't it? 15 mm. years of age. Um, but, I mean, looking at those odds, clearly the layers think it's going to be a two-woman a two race here. They do. Well, um, Adlington and Fries finished first and second in the World Championships in this race last year, so there is form there. But Ledecky, uh, 
didn't actually participate in the Worlds last year, but she's, she's, she's sort of, obviously she's still very, very young, but she's just finding her feet this year, 2012. Surprised the, the American team how quick she's progressed. But is she, is she, has she progressed quick enough to challenge here? I think mm. 9 to 1's a bit big. Yeah. yeah, I mean, every time I see really short prices, I kind of think, right, take the short price for the men's backstroke, the short price for the women's backstroke, yeah. throw in Becky, and you've probably got about an even money shot. So yeah. It doesn't appeal, doesn't appeal does it? No, because you need all, three right? outcomes, and oh. I'd say tonight's two are, are, are more likely, probably, than, than Adlington. And one to two is way short for me. It's way short. It's, 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 it's an old-fashioned patriotic price, isn't it? Mm. And, and um, it, it does make no appeal. I mean, you know, I think going into these games, it was a bonus if Adlington got a gold, even even in this race, which, of course, it is her, uh, her favourite event. But, uh, yeah, I agree with you. One to two, too short for me, but let's hope she does it. Yeah, just purely. There are some times when the best bet is no bet. Keep yeah. your money in your pocket, yeah. watch the race, cheer her on. If she wins, great. Yeah. You're not going to be beating yourself up about missing a twos on shot. Not at all. Um, and if she doesn't win, then you're thinking, well, it was a shrewd move not to not to get involved yeah. with, your, with your hard earned. Yeah, I think, you know, a controversial point, but patriotism almost um, beats financial gain during this, this wonderful event. Maybe I'm an old fashioned, though, I don't know. But There's a, There is a market. I mean, you can actually bet on Adlington not to win. So if she doesn't win, um, then you. You kind of, it probably feels yeah, it's, not very patriotic. It's a dirty bet, isn't it? To yeah. be honest, it's a, it's a very dirty bet. You have to you go to confession on Sunday morning and say, "I'm sorry, Lord, I actually backed against Rebecca Adler. It's just a sweet, sweet. But then girl. I suppose you've got the consolation if she wins of being able to sort of cheer her on. It's like a no lose situation. Yeah, if, if you know, there's people who always say, "Oh, I always back against my, my team. own teammate." Yeah. Insurance. I, I find that quite sad. But, but <laughs> that, that, that's me. You know. You're a hard man to please. I am. I am. I am. Let me talk to you about the hockey. Because yeah. I've enjoyed the hockey. I watched yeah. most of um, Team GB's demolition of Japan, thrashed mm. them 4-0. Mm. And uh, have you ever played hockey, by the way? Um, once, very badly. Yeah. It is a vicious game. Brutal. Oh, it is. And one of the girls in the G... I can't actually remember her name, but one of the girls was injured. She got a stick from a Japanese girl, yeah. right on, flush on the face. Accidental, obviously. Yeah. She's gone to hospital. She's got a broken jaw. Yeah. They've put a plate in the jaw, and they have not ruled out her carrying on at some point later in this yeah. tournament with her, a broken jaw. Her name's Katie Walsh. Thank you. I think. Or yeah, Katie no, I'm Brooke. sure you're right. Um, yeah, that just, no I mean, they're so... Uh, I, so I can't just, believe so, she'll... I saw the play. pictures. It was a massively brutal picture. Mm. Right? So having, having beaten the Japanese, next up are the Koreans, mm. I, I would be expecting them to go the same way as Japan did. Yeah, so of, similar, of similar class, mm. um, Japan and Korea. And, and Great Britain finished third, or rather England, you know, genuinely, England finished third in the World in the World Cup in 2010. So this is a a team with great pedigree. We should be expecting uh, Britain to get very deep in this competition, and they really are a class above Japan here, Trevor. I'd, I'd expect them to win comfortably. Well, well, we'll see the odds in a moment. But let's welcome Mark Langdon from the Racing Post first of all. How are you, Mark? Hello, guys. You okay? I'm oh, very Mark. good, thanks. I know. I know. Obviously, you're uh, you're mostly football, but I'm sure you've. Sneaked a little look at the uh, at the hockey. Did you catch any? Oh of, yeah, um, can't get, can't get enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> Did no, you? No, I was really negative about the Olympics before it yeah, started, right. but uh, I just I just can't stop watching it. Uh, it's uh, fantastic. <laughs> um, did you manage to see any of Team GB's demolition of uh, Japan in the women's hockey? Yeah, I saw some of it. Um, it was clashing with some other major sport, wasn't it? But I did see some of it. And, I mean, we're pretty sweet on, on Britain getting a medal, um, actually. Yeah. I, I think Holland will be difficult to beat outright, but there's no sort of reason, I don't think, why, why Britain can't at least get sort of, you know, a silver or, um, you, you know, a bronze medal in, in the outrights. Because, you know, apart from Holland, like I say, I, I think that, that Britain have got a great chance of a medal. I mean, it was almost like watching football because Barry Davis was commentating yeah. on it. So, yeah, you had yeah, that. Yeah, it's great. Uh, fantastic amazing, amazing. to hear, Barry. Um, let's have a look at the odds then, if we can, for the uh, for this upcoming game between Team GB and Korea. There we go. Very, very short. We've, yeah, it's a short price short. show tonight, isn't it? It's a very short price hmm. show. No, 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 the kind of prices that get viewers that excited, I imagine. But one to six, probably a, a fair price, like, like Mark says. Uh, you, you know, Great Ben have a real chance here to get a medal. They yeah. got bronze in 1992, I don't yeah. know if you can remember. Like Jane Sexsmith, she was the, yes, the darling of the yeah. wee ginger hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just remembered her last night, but 1 to 6, like we say, a fair price. Uh, South Korea of the same kind of level as Japan, so we, we, we we're expecting Britain to win here quite comfortably. Mm, okay. Um, sorry, go on, Mark. 
No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, in the world rankings, Korea are eighth and Japan are ninth. So I think if you're looking yeah. at it, really, um, you, you are playing against a similar um, a kind of opponent. Yeah, so it should hopefully should be fairly plain sailing. Uh, for our girls, let's uh, let's get right back in in probably all our comfort zones and, and talk football, Mark. Because the mm. big story so far uh, in, in the football has been the elimination of Spain, who were um, second favourites at the start. I think, no, they were favourites, I think, ahead of Brazil, or certainly close to them. Um, and they've lost their first two games, which no one could have predicted. No, and obviously out of the competition. Yeah. I mean, the way they won the European Championship under 21 to qualify, I certainly didn't see this happening. I have to say, I felt that you know Brazil, Spain were drawn to sort of be away from each other until the final. I felt that that would be the final. It would have been a brilliant final had the real Spain turned up. But I think what we have, uh, and certainly what I've noticed, and with hindsight, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, is that the teams that have relied most on European-based players have not performed at their best so far. I think that we've seen, if you have a look at even, say, Uruguay, with Cavani and Suarez, yeah. they're not in their season yet. And, and that, it, it does show, um, that there's no doubt, that you, I think if you're looking at it, the, the Asian teams, for me, apart from Brazil, are, are the ones that have really stood out. Of course, Japan has started with two wins. I think South Korea were excellent in, in picking up four points. They drew with Mexico at the better of that, and then also went on to beat Switzerland. I think that, you know, they're the sort of sides we should be looking at here. Brazil getting really short in the outright market. Um, with Spain going out, Britain's second favourites. I can't have that. I mean, you know, I know they beat UAE, but I still think that they're a long way short of, of being a medal prospect in this competition. I'm looking towards the Asian teams to do some damage. Mark, it's Chris here. I just, I just wanted to ask you, Hi. obviously, you research very thoroughly. I yeah, read you in the Racing Post and stuff like that. Who's impressed you the most? Uh, so far in this event, that, who surprised you the most? Who you expected not to do very well? Who's really surprised you by doing well? Um, I would say Senegal have probably been the biggest surprise so far. Um, if you have a look at Asian uh, African teams, have had a really rich history in the sort of this Olympics and underage sort of uh, events before. Um, you know that they tend to overachieve in these kind of tournaments. I mean, Nigeria reached the final last time out. You know, uh, the Ghana, there have been plenty of examples of, of African teams doing really well at the Olympics. And I was looking down the list of African teams before it started and couldn't really see where the challenge was, was going to come from. Senegal had, had a, a few blows, you know, that they talked about bringing in Barr and uh, Papi Cissé and also a couple of other overage players. And it didn't work out for them, but I think it's worked to their advantage because... Uh, I, I know that sort of you know against Britain they really surprised Britain with uh, not only the way that they sort of came out and played their football, also the strength of the side you know throughout it, and and that they were really good value for their two 0 win against Uruguay the other day. I yeah. mean mm -hmm. you know to play with ten men for sixty minutes and keep Cavani and Suarez relatively quiet. Um, I think Senegal have probably been the team that um, has opened my eye. I, I really didn't expect this from Senegal at all. Mm. Uh, I know there were a few people who thought Egypt might be the best African side. Um, it's definitely Senegal. And you know, if they can avoid Brazil uh, and, and win the group uh, and make sure that they get away from Brazil for the rest of the tournament, they, they could easily reach the final. I've been very impressed with them. All right, let's have a look mm. at the current odds then. This is for the outright uh, Olympic football. 8-13 to 13 right. Brazil would expect that. Britain are now 9-1 to one second favourites. Uruguay are 12s. Japan 14s with Mexico. You can see the prices there. And Senegal 16-1 to one shot, Chris. Yeah, they've, they've, they've halved in price. They've, they've done, yeah. uh, like Mark says, really impressed a lot of people. And, and, and that's why their price is short. And Brazil, very, very short. They're 8-13. to 13. I mean, that, yeah. that's 74 they went off at 8-13. to 13. Very, very short. And Great Britain, to be honest, what have Great Britain done to be, to be classed as second no. favourites? Not for me at all. Uruguay doubled in price as well, 12-1. to one. Mm. They were might up at 6-1. to one. I've been really impressed by South Korea, actually. Here, way down here at 22. Yeah. 22 at 1. South Korea really impressed me. Uh, the good uh, the form of the Asian qualifiers. Good friend of his, obviously, leading up to the event as well. And uh, so far, so good in terms of the competition. So South Korea, 22 at 1 for me. I totally agree with you, Mark, about Britain being overrated. I, I watched the game okay. last night, and there was that period just after um, UAE uh, equalised. They could easily have scored again. It, Britain were on the ropes for about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Uruguay will beat them when Absolutely. they play them at the Millennium Stadium. I know that Uruguay have 
not sort of we haven't seen the best of them yet. And like I was saying earlier, Suarez and Cavani have not, you know, been at their best. I think they're still struggling to reach match fitness. But I mean, for me, Uruguay will beat Great Britain. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. I mean, there's not really that much to sort of admire. I don't think about what Britain have actually done so far. I mean, I thought they were, were, were second best for against Senegal for, for large parts of the game. They beat UAE, but that was to be expected, and that they made a, a struggle at that. You know, they, they've not kept a clean sheet so far. They haven't really got a striker who you could sort of nail down and say, yeah, I really fancy him to score goals. I, I've also got concerns over whether Bellamy and Giggs can keep going. I mean, you know, Giggs is, what, 38, and, and Bellamy struggles to play two games in, in a week in the Premier League, and this would be his third game in sort of no time at all. And I think if you do fancy Uruguay, rather than just backing them to win the game, they might not be sort of the worst bet outright at, at you know, 12 to 1, because if this, they're the sort of team that, when they get through, we saw that in the Copa America, didn't win the group, ended up with Argentina in the quarterfinals, but that's when they came alive, and you know that they were a team that grew into that competition. It was pretty much the same in the World Cup, if you remember, too. They, they weren't that spectacular in the group stages of that, and ended up reaching the semi-final. So I think if you're looking... Uh, so if you fancy sort of uh, opposing Great Britain, the best way of doing that might be to just back Uruguay outright and hope that Suarez and Cavani can finally come good. And is Brazil eight to thirteen? Is that uh, too short for you, Mark? Um, I wouldn't be backing it, but I wouldn't be in sort of a rush to sort of try and lay it either. I'd rather try and bet each way and get the team that plays them in the final because I think what we've got with Brazil is were clearly the best attacking force in, in the competition by a long way. Neymar uh, has been excellent in these two games. Holt, um, again, where he's you know, based with a European team, I don't think we've seen the best of him, but you know, they've got Leandro or Pata up front, it doesn't really matter. I think Oscar in midfield has shown everybody why Chelsea paid £25 million for him. They've got a couple of problems at the back, and that, that would be my concern, you know, conceded twice to Egypt, you know, they, they were behind as well, of course, to Belarus. I think, you know, Juan at centre-back alongside Thiago Silva looks... Uh, he hasn't looked the best. I always think there's a mistake in Raphael, the Manchester United right back. The goalkeeper, of course, got injured before the tournament, so they've got a relatively inexperienced keeper. So I wouldn't be rushing out to back the 8-13 to 13 because a team like Uruguay could beat them. You know, Uruguay are, are warriors and you know, they'll fight hard. And I think Senegal are another team that could cause them problems You know, if, if they were to meet them too. So I'm not in a rush to back Brazil 8-13, to 13, but I think that that probably is a fair price simply because of how good their forward line is. All right, well, time will tell. Uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank we'll you. No doubt right. join you again soon. Um, and when we come back, we're going to be talking horse racing because it's glorious Goodwood. Are there any glorious bets? We'll find out in just a moment. Welcome back. You're watching The Punter on Sports Tonight. And we are going to talk glorious Goodwood. It all mm. starts uh, tomorrow. Let's hope the weather stays dry. There's some excellent racing. Oh, yeah. Um, I think for once, um, the Lennox Stakes probably supersedes the Sussex in terms of interest because obviously Frankel yeah. looks like a, a, the proverbial shoeing in the Sussex. A betting interest, certainly. Yeah. I mean, Frankel, yeah. we're talking maybe going off here at 1 to 20, which is an extraordinary price, a vulgar price. That is, isn't it? It's, 1 to it's 20. really extraordinary. But yeah. the, the Lennox day, it's always a trial for the, um, usually a trial for the St. Ledger, so in, interested in that. But yeah, the real star of the show, Glory is Good, will of course be Frankel uh, tomorrow. But it's a great five days of racing, Trevor. Probably for me, it's probably the third best summer festival of the season, so I'm very much excited about it. I mean, I, it's only a Group 2 race, isn't it? Um, and yet, it sort of feels like it should be a Group 1 race in some way. Yeah, there's some, some really classy horses in it, there really is, and um, I, I'm expecting a very uh, a competitive race, uh, some really good profiles, and yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the odds. Librano, five-time group winner? Yeah, I like Librano. He's that, that won his last two races in, in great form. We all know about Richard, Richard Hannon and Richard Hughes in, in absolutely sparkling form at the moment, but 
No for me, Chacha Madi for me is the shout. It's, it's the favourite, and I hate backing favourites, as you know, guys. It's no part of my DNA. <laughs> but Chacha Madi. That's the Cecil horse, isn't it? Uh, that's right, yeah. yeah. I, and, and Cecil, unfortunately, not with us at, at Glorious Goodwood this week due to health problems. But uh, Chacha Madi for me deserves to be favourite. I think she's fin finished in the first three in the last nine races, so as consistent as it comes. Tough as teak, and for me, the class act in this race. Around 74 tomorrow, eh? Let's have a look, see if we can have a look at the prices. Um, you're quite right with your, your stats about um, Chacha uh placed in every race since the start of 2011. Yeah. Foxtrot Romeo um, is the only three-year-old in the field. That's yeah. a five-to-one shot. Can you see past the, the, the leading couple in the market, Chris, or not? Um, I, I am very much with Chacha Medi here at 74. Lebrano, uh, uh, the Hannity Hughes team in great form. It's won its last two races. Definitely worth a shout. Foxtrot Romeo was second in Irish 2000 Guineas, so that's got wonderful form there, definitely. Edinburgh Knight, very progressive at 71. You know what I like here? And you can laugh at me and you can. I'll never pellets. laugh. I you, never you laugh, laugh at you. Laugh at me. I never 25 do. to 1 here, way down again. Mark Love. Yeah. Now he's an old horse. He started, right, he started racing in 2003, nine years ago. He's 11 years old. He's an old boy, an OEP in horse racing terms, but I think he's got a shout tomorrow. He won't win, but each way, 25 to 1, get me on. I don't, I don't laugh. I laugh at Butler a lot, but <laughs> not at you. Yeah. Never at you. Um, let's move on to the, um, the Gordon Stakes, because this is a, a potentially a trial for the St. Ledger. Isn't this it? is the trial for St. Ledger. Yeah. I made a bit of a full pile on this. is the trial for... We saw some great horses win this and go on and win the St. Ledger. Uh, Locarno, 60s icon. This is icon, Locarno as well. In Conduit. Conduit, yeah. Written by Frankie Dottori in that magical September day at Doncaster. But yeah, a good St. Ledger field here. We're looking for a horse, Trevor, to, to, to challenge Camelot. <laughs> Camelot could go off St. Ledger day one to six. We're looking for a horse here to take him on. And Michelangelo is the one that everyone's talking about, but not quite for me. No, I mean Camelot is what about two's on for the ledger at the moment? Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, and he'll be a, he'll be a lot short on yeah. that if he if he um, if he turns up on like, September the seventeenth. Yeah, but it, 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 that it's a really exciting story for racing the Triple Crown if Camelot wins the same yes. ledger. But yes. we want somebody to come at the pack tomorrow and, and be really impressive and start putting a bit of pressure <laughs> on Camelot. I thought Michelangelo was really impressive in the in the uh, crooked hat stakes in particular. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's won its last two races. That that race it, it was at Goodwood the cocked hat stakes, and it's, it's a it's a derby trial. And you know, John Gosden at the moment, the guy cannot do anything wrong. My oh my, every race he enters and he's pretty much got a winner. Mm. He did it again on, on on Sunday in that race in France. An absolutely incredible form at the moment. And obviously he trains um, he he trains the horse and uh, yeah. But big shout, definitely. Well, let's have a look at the prices then, if we can, for the uh, the Gordon Stakes. We yeah, mentioned we that Michelangelo is the favourite. Um, noble Mission, of course, is Frankel's brother. That's I'm not much mistaken. Me, that's for me. And that's where I'm going for my bet. 100 to 30 here, Noble Mission. Right. He's a battle-hardened horse. He's got guts. He's got stamina. He's got speed. He's got. He's not the. He's not the best horse in the world by any stretch of the imagination. But boy, he's been around the block. He's he's raced far more times than Michelangelo. So he, he's a bit of a warrior. So I I, I think the the price discrepancy here is just is, is too much. 6 to 4, 100 to 30. For me, Noble Mission is the value bet. Mm. At 100 to 30. Than the, the fashionable Michelangelo. And in fact, five of those seven that you can see on the screen there are actually entered for the St. Ledger. Yeah, yeah, it's all, all you know, So all we, will, we will get some clues, that's for sure. We definitely will get clues. You, you get this race and you get the great voltage at York, set you up for St. Ledger. I'll mention another outsider, because that's, that's how I roll. Here we go. We're going to do it again. Twenty. You'll do, you do your knees in here. I will do man. I, well, I did last week at the gym. I did genuinely last week. I've been in agony all weekend. But anyway, that's by the by. Twenty to one. Ed the Gas. Ed the Gas. Strange name. Funny name. Rubbish name. Right. But it's got decent a decent profile. Won a conditions race at Sandown quite recently, and then it finished third in the Queen's Vase. You remember the Queen's Vase? The Queen won it. So Prince Philip. I do. Had to I give, do remember. Yeah, Prince yeah. Prince yeah. Philip had to give uh, the Queen the Queen the prize. It was that. If you're a royalist, you must keep have found it, it funny. Yeah. Keep it in the family. Keep it in the family. Well, they do. Yeah. Where <laughs> does um, where does Glorious Goodwood rate for you in the kind of pantheon of of meetings and festivals? Um, it's third place for me. It's sometimes Children, it's fashion. One. Well, that's jump. Oh, you're talking all flat. Uh, it's just, just flat, flat only. Okay. Oh, sorry, Trev. Just right. flat only. Royal Ascot number yep. one. 
uh, the Ebor meeting at York, okay. which comes up at the end of August in second place, and then Glorious Goodwood in third place. If, you, if you're asking me what's the most attractive, who's the, the, in terms of ladies and, and, yeah. and dresses and attractive um, scenes, Glorious Goodwood by a mile at number one. I went there a couple of times and it blew my mind. Well, the girls did. <laughs> well, it doesn't take much, believe me. Much <laughs> um, anything in a skirt. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about some of the novelty markets that are around. One of which, which is fascinating, Danny Boyle, he of opening ceremony fame, five to four wow. to be knighted uh, by the end of the year. What wow. do you think of that? Um, I think that is a fair shout because he got the Queen involved in it, didn't he? Huh? He got the Queen involved in I, it. Uh, it. To me, that was, the, that was the most memorable. I know the Queen was. Knighted, it was. But you're, the fact that when right. you saw Bot, you just yeah. thought, yes, and it's going to be a shot from behind or a distant shot of that yeah. lookalike lady who's always in it. Yeah. And yeah, you're thinking, yeah. it's the Queen saying, good evening, yeah. Mr. Bond. And it was the way they filmed it. It was just like, oh, I was almost yeah. anticipating. You're like, yeah. wait, is yeah. it the Queen? Is it the Queen? Is it the Queen? And it was the Queen. Yeah. Amazing. But you're right, Trevor. Four to one originally for Boyle to get knighted. And Ladbrokes actually reported, Jessica Bridge from Ladbrokes reported a £2,000 bet on Boyle at four to one to be knighted, cut into five to four. So the money's come for Boyle, Amazing. the man who directed Train Spotting, of course. Yep. Uh, choose life, choose money, choose. Choose a bet on Danny Boyle here at 4 to 1. Do you know, if it, will he be doing the closing ceremony as well, or do you just do the opening ceremony? I don't know, actually, but yeah. I'm looking forward to that. We saw the Arctic Monkeys, and that really got me excited <laughs> on Friday night. Who are we going to see on uh, the closing ceremony? I've got my fingers crossed for Oasis, Radiohead, and a bit of blur, please. That'd be great. So who are your, who are your sort of best bets for the next few days? It doesn't have to be for tonight, the next sort of week coming up. Anything caught your attention, either Goodwood-wise or in the Olympics? Yes, an Olympic bet. Um, and I know, I know virtually nothing about diving, uh, right. Trevor. Uh, but I just, I've done so a wee bit. So what team do you sport? <laughs> of Spurs, <laughs> Queen of the South. No, you're all right, okay. You know, we, don't, we don't dive up in Scotland, yeah. we're, we're, a hard, <laughs> we're a hardy bunch. Uh, Chubo and the diving, Chubo, no Subo, Chubo, right. four, four to six to win the diving. He absolutely dominated uh, the World Championships last year. He's by far the best diver. This is the 10 metres platform individual with yeah. Tom Daly yeah. next Friday. He's four to six. I've spoke to a lot of uh, experts who reckon he should be one to four, one to five. So Chubo, four to six to beat Tom Daly. And I know I, I, I'm a bit bad going against Tom Daly, but I've got a bit of a confession to make. I just, I, I just never managed to like the guy. You I don't, can't I, I warm don't, to I him. don't know what it is. I just can't. I don't. I just can't get behind Tom Daly. Just, and I'm getting a lot of abuse for it. Any bets that have that stand out for you as being particularly bad bets or sucker bets to be avoided at all costs? Well, I think, I mean. Team GB at the football. Team GB, actually. We should point out, actually, we did, the three of us, me, yeah. you, and Nigel, all say that when we qualify for Group yeah. A, that was 100 to 30. Uh, that's now 7 to 4. So, yeah. um, like Mark Landon was talking about earlier on, it's all about the Uruguay game. Yeah. And I, I completely agree with Mark Landon. I think great Team GB are in trouble here. And I think Uruguay will beat them. And, and well, that will pretty much kill off Team GB's hopes because then mm. Senegal just needs to avoid defeat against the UAE, which they're definitely capable of doing. To, to kill off uh, Great Britain's hopes, but yeah. We uh, will see in a couple see. of evenings' time. Um, Chris, thanks for your company thanks, tonight. Um, and more particularly, thank you very much to you for watching. We'll do it all over again tomorrow evening at 7 on the Punter. For now, though, from both of us, bye bye. The other good news is America have won five silvers, so that's five chances for golds mm -hmm. they cannot win. Absolutely, Trevor. You, you called it first and I, I followed you and I thought it was a great show. I, I just couldn't understand the pure price discrepancy between the US mm. and China after China won 15 more gold medals in 2008 than the US counterparts. And we've saw, we've saw China rise up from finishing 11th in 1988 right up to being top of the pile in 2008. Mm. They're on the way upwards. And that, that original price of 74 was very generous. It's early days, but let's talk to the man whose firm laid 7-4 to four, to both Chris and to me, mm. and hopefully to you, about China winning more golds. Russ Wiseman from Sporting Bet. How are you, Russ? Hey, Trev. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Hi, Russ. Um, are you about to um, take your athletics or your Olympic uh, trader out and give him a flogging for, for putting up 7-4 to four about the Chinese? Early days, but they've got a nice little lead already. He's on coffee duty, Trevor. <laughs> coffee duty, that guy. We don't like him at the moment. He's not doing a good job at all. No, it's a very tricky market, this one, because I still think we'll see some fluctuation. 
Obviously, the initial 74 we laid, we did see some good money odds on for, for the USA, but the bulk of the money then when the big tipping papers came out, the big tipping lines was for uh, the Chinese. You guys were ahead of the market, and I have to give you credit for that as well. But there's a long way to go, isn't it, guys? A lot of gold medals to be won, but yep. looking at momentum at the moment and the way it started off and, and just the pure mass of it, they look good odds on shots at the moment, China. Yeah, they do. I think yeah. the big money you saw for the States was Bet Butlers, who's um, going to be in the poorhouse <laughs> shortly. Um, got to ask you, Russ, about the, the controversy that Chris and I were just talking about, um, the cauldron. I think I did actually ask you, didn't I, last week, what happens if it's none of the above? And that's exactly what has happened. And we've got this situation where different bookmakers have different rules. And I find that a little bit off, to be honest. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I didn't actually hear the previous conversation, so apologies for that. But I've got very firm views on this, actually. And you might not like what I'm about to say, but... You know, punters, you have to tread very carefully on what I call a silly market. This is a silly market, guys. This isn't mm. for proper punters. This is five and ten, as we said. And I think you just have to accept that if you're betting on markets like that, you just have to abide by what the bookmakers say. Bookmakers are under absolutely no obligation at all to make... Just William Hill, on the other hand, are refunding all stakes. So if you back, say, Roger Bannister with Hills, it's a money-back job. If you backed him with either Labrooks or Paddy Power, you'll lose your dough. One man whose uh, input on this I'm fascinated to hear is Russ Wiseman. We'll speak to Russ a little bit later. But why do you think it's fair? Why do you think it's fair? I don't get... If I'm back Roger Bannister mm. with, uh, with Paddy Power, I'm furious because my mate, who's backed him with Hills, hasn't lost his money and I have. It's a, it's a volatile, really um, an ordinary market. You know, it's, it's not an everyday market. And when you place a bet in this kind of market, you've got to expect strange things to happen or sometimes not even get a run for your money. And that's mm. what's happened to a lot of these people who've bet on Roger Bannister. But Labrox and Paddy Power didn't really have to, to get involved and, and pay out the seven mentors. Um, so, you know, if you've backed one of those seven, you've got a nice surprise. Yes, but it's no consolation to me as a Bannister backer. I guess whichever side of the fence you're on is, yeah. is the He wasn't side... involved, so he shouldn't get paid. No. <laughs> that, that's, that's well, but, but no, because Bannister, OK, he didn't light it, you're right, but nor did Redgrave, and nor did Kay Holmes, they didn't light it either. Yeah, I, I would have, if I had backed them and not got paid, I would have yeah. accepted that. Right. I just think it's a nice bonus by Ladbrokes and Paddy Power. A very shrewd one, and I calculated one, with, with bear in mind, it's a very mainstream market that was discussed in the BBC. But yeah, um, I'll tell you what I think. I think they should be an option on all these kind of novelty markets, any other or none of the above. So we, we had the Queen, we had David Bond, we had Harry Potter. There sh if there was an any other quoted, that would have solved the problem, wouldn't it? It would have been a very short price, to be honest. OK, I mean, but I, still I it would have given punters an option and there wouldn't have been any argument. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. But, you know, it's a fun market. Mm. Stakes should have been very low. Mm. I just, I wouldn't get you bogged down in how serious this is. I mean, you know, I, I would feel sorry for like... But it's, it's a point of principle, I think, Chris. Yeah, I, I happen to think that if I had a bad balance that I wouldn't have been too bothered. I would have just accepted it and reveled in the open You're scene. a better loser than me, <laughs> for sure. Um, I want to talk to you about happier things now, yes. Olympic-wise. Both of us were very sweet, weren't we, on the, the pre-Olympic bet, most gold medals, China versus the States... We're off to a flying start. 7-4 we tipped it up at, didn't we? we did. um, 7-3 is the current score. Yeah. And the other good news, 7-3 to China, that is. The good evening. It's Monday night. The Olympics are in full swing and you are watching The Punter. And you're watching it on Sports Tonight in the company of myself, Trevor Harris, and Chris Graham. How are you, Chris? I'm good, Trevor. I'm good. I'm really enjoying the Olympics. Sir. I'm also good, but I'm frustrated. Yeah? Very frustrated Tell by this, this cauldron uh, will not go away. The whole <laughs> nonsense surrounding it. This controversy. Different bookmakers, different rules. I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't too surprised to be honest with you with the, the different uh, payout systems. I mean, various incidents these tend to happen where, where some bookmakers will, will pay out in controversial decisions. So I, I wasn't too surprised. And a very shrewd move by Paddy Power and Labrooks uh, paying out in the seven metres and what is a very mainstream market. You say it's a shrewd move, and just to let you know exactly what Chris is talking about, Paddy Power and Labrooks are paying out on any of the mentors, so the likes of Redgrave and Kelly Holmes, who had a mentor, one of those young athletes like the Cauldron.